Professor Huang Yiping, we thank you for your time today. China, as you know, has set a growth target of 5% GDP. Some analysts, including economists, say the number is ambitious given the very challenging environment, both geopolitically and also geoeconomically. I won't ask you if 5% is achievable or not, but I will ask you this. What will be the consequences if China misses this mark? Well, a number of points. Um, number one, I think China's GDP growth potential is probably around five or slightly above. So um, target of 5% is not particularly ambitious. But of course, we saw um, the difficulties um, last year um, and giving the low base effect also for last year, um, this year's 5% would be um, other things being equal are uh, more ambitious um, than last year. But I think it's probably achievable uh, given um, the structural policies already announced and is still being implemented. But most importantly, the macroeconomic policy will be more aggressive or more, more active um, this year, particularly the fiscal policy. So I think it's probably achievable. But your question about whether or not uh, um, it will be a big issue for China or for the rest of the world if China misses 5%, I guess the question is how, by how much? If it's slightly below 5%, I don't think the impact will be material. Um, but if it misses by a big margin, it could be um, an important issue, number one, for the confidence. Um, but number two, um, obviously, we still like need some kind of a recovery for the Chinese economy. And if we miss it, there will be some other um, uh, chain reactions in the market. Finally, well, for the rest of the world, China currently is contributing something like one percentage point to GDP growth. So if China misses the target, it will be a negative factor uh, for the global economy. But as I said, it, it really depends on by how much. May we take a look now at the new growth and stimulus measures, including those that were unveiled by Premier Li Qiang in his report to the National mm. People's Congress. Again, there is concern that this is not enough at a time when millions of people, including young people in China, are looking for a job. What do you think? Well, there are probably always um, not enough um, stimulus package um, in the eyes of investors and other market participants. But I will tell you this, this year's macroeconomic policies will be much more aggressive than last year. If you look at last year, in fact, the fiscal policy, by definition, you're looking at the net expansion of fiscal spending, it was actually contractionally. The monetary policy is the, to some extent, but if we take into account the low inflation rate, the in, real interest rate was actually became higher. So compared to what happened last year, I actually think the macroeconomic policy is much more aggressive. Monetary policy will continue to um, ease, particularly if the Fed stops hiking, and even if they started easing, uh, cutting down the rate, that will create a more favorable environment for PBOC to ease its monetary policy. The fiscal policy, people looking at like the deficit rate coming down from 3.8% of GDP last year to 3% this year, and people thinking, well, this is much smaller. But that's a wrong interpretation. If you're putting together the direct official spending plus the spending coming out of some other funding, special government bond and so on, the total government spending will rise by around 8% this year compared to 1.3% expansion of last year. If you look at what we call expansion, that is the aggregate net spending, i.e. spending minus revenue this year, will probably rise by 25% compared to a minus 1.3% last year. So macro policy-wise, there's no question it's much, much more aggressive this year. Well, I'm in Hong Kong, many miles away from where the two sessions took place in Beijing, and where the buzzword this year was a new phrase, new productive forces. What exactly mm. does that mean? 
Well, it might be difficult for everybody to ac- accurately understand what it does mean. But I will tell you this: the Chinese growth model is changing from input-driven growth to innovation-driven growth. The so-called new productive force, in my view, is about innovation,、um, scientific innovation, industrial upgrading, and so on. At the end of the day, the question is. How can we improve total factor productivity? So these are the old words we can use to explain the new concept. The question, I think, it comes back to what the government and the market has been emphasizing for years: that whether or not China can escalate its efforts in promoting productivity growth through more innovation. Let's turn our focus now to China's growth trajectory. For decades now, China has been the economic miracle story of、mm. the world. If we look at the whole of human history, actually, but now there are deep worries that China's growth has peaked and that there are no good stories coming in the short-term future. If that is accurate, how should we all prepare in China and outside of China? Well, the first point I like to make is, if economic performance of the last forty years was described as a miracle, we know the English word and the Chinese word miracle. Miracle is something you cannot explain under the normal circumstances. So I think even for China, it's not a strange thing for a miracle to end at some stage. What I think we hope and we need to work very hard on it is for the growth model to transit from the miracle to a more normal growth. But normal growth can still be very robust, strong growth, like many other successful high-income econo- economies experienced in the past. So that's what I think the whole entire country has been working on. That growth rate is coming down. That's a fact, and that's something we have to accept. But hopefully, it's not a collapse that、um, some uh, pessimistic uh, analyst uh, predicting. I don't obviously buy that argument, and people worrying about a lots of risks in the Chinese economy. But you look at the innovation, um, the new productive force that is emerging in China. It is happening everywhere. Um, remember, people are st- started to worry about the exports, like the EVs, the um, the solar panels, and so on. It means the productive force is up being upgraded. Quite effectively, and in some cases, the magnitude, the scale of these upgrading, start to worry some foreign、um, countries.、Um, and obviously, we need to be careful about the smooth expansion. But I'm not too worried that innovation, as long as innovation is happening, we're going to smoothly transit,、uh, transition toward a high-income economy. Even though、um, economic miracle might be behind us. Professor Huang, allow me to tap into your insights for one last question. For、mm. that, let's talk about China's so-called three perils. One of them being its property sector, the other being local government debts, and the third being risks for its small banks. One by one, is there a solution for each, or is there a general fix that we can apply? Well, I think these are all big problems we're facing, and we need to address. However, if you think of these issues as causes for systemic financial crisis, that might be a wrong assessment. I give just give you an, an example. So people worrying about lots of local government debt, and think well, if you have a debt crisis, the economy will collapse, right? But we have lots of local government borrowing, and which amount to something like forty percent of GDP. If you add the official central government debt, the total government liabilities at the moment is around sixty percent of GDP. And if you know the numbers for other countries, you would know this is not excessively high. In fact, this is still lower than many other countries. 
Now we needed to reconfigure the fiscal system. Therefore, more revenues could be reallocated to the local government and so on. But the liabilities itself could be an issue for lowering efficiency going forward. But that's that would not lead to a scenario of a financial crisis because the central government alone would be able to support or withstand. 60% of GDP、um, as a total liability. So the scenario I see is more like some loss of efficiency going forward.、Um, therefore, it could have some in- negative impact on economic growth, but it is not going to lead to a systemic financial crisis as many pessimistic analysts envisioned.、Um, they might be right. Um, for these other countries, when they saw these problems, but I think we do need to realize the central government liabilities at the moment is still only twenty percent of GDP, and still has the capacity to expand or to take on some more responsibilities to stabilize the local problems. Professor Huang Yiping, it's been fascinating conversing with you and learning from you today. Thank you. Well, that was a fascinating conversation for me as a journalist and a broadcaster. I love how people walk around a question and look at it from a three hundred and sixty degree perspective, and that is exactly the value that we got from that interview with Professor Wang Yiping. I also thought it was very. Good to hear and encouraging to hear that he not only thinks there's a potential to meet five percent economic growth, but maybe even to surpass it by some margin as well. Why is that good? Well, it's good for 1.4 billion people in China itself, but that's also really good for eight billion people around the world. I think also what's interesting is that coming off the other interview we did with Jia Xinguo the other day, he talked about telling the story of China, and I think he does that very well. Both in explaining complex ideas and making them understandable to all of us, but also in his ability to communicate so fluently and fluidly in English. Stories are important because they allow us to understand. They lessen misunderstanding and they create space for dialogue and tolerance as well. So that's what I think we got out of here, and I'll be.